A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily, the podcast covering high profile and under the radar cases from across the country every week. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. Our cases this week, nine days after a repeat offender is released from prison, he stalks and he targets five women. And on his sixth attempt, he sexually assaults and kills the woman. He was seen on street security cameras between midnight and 2 a.m. carrying out his terror. Two questions. Why was he let out in the first place? And why didn't anyone monitoring these street cameras do something and call police? But first, a woman convicted of poisoning a family friend with eye drops in order to steal $300,000 has been sentenced to life. But before she heard her sentence, she made a two-hour statement to the court that pretty much nailed her coffin. We are recording this on Wednesday, April 9th of 2024. Our guest today is Dr. Tracy Tambora, an expert on domestic violence and a professor of criminal justice at the University of New Haven and a dear friend of the show. Tracy, welcome back. How are you? Oh, I'm so good, Anna. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, it's always a pleasure to be here. And although I am a professor of criminal justice, I always learn something from the show. Wow. Okay. That's exciting. <laughs> I I love the scales of justice behind you there, Dr. Tracy. That were that those scales were in my family for two generations. Yes. Really? Do you yes. come from a family of lawyers or professors? I you know, I have an interesting family background. Most of my family were uh, laborers of some sort, but my grandfather, one of eight, went to law school after World War II on the GI Bill. And all of the rest of his family, really eighth grade to 12th grade education, but he went to law school, practiced law, and that had a lasting impression on me. Yeah. And those are his scales? Those are his scales or they were his uh, relative who gave them to him. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Well, then we have the right person on the program today. Tracy, we Thank have you. some very disturbing cases as always. Um, the second one in particular really will speak to your expertise when we yes. have this serial predator mm -hmm. uh, who should have never been let out on the streets. And this first one, you know, is an interesting twist on a crime that we see over and over again. You know, we see people being killed for financial gain. Sure. And the reason this one is interesting is that we've seen an uptick in the last few years on murders that have been committed with the use of eye drops. And it's fascinating. Yeah. And this is one of those cases. Yeah, it's, this is what I mean when I say I always learn something from the show, because as criminologists, we study crime on the aggregate, like what's happening in the general population. Something as specific as an eye drop related homicide is not something that I've paid particular attention. But when I read about this case um, and I then I Googled something to prepare and a bunch of cases using eye drops came up. So yeah. I had no idea that this was now a weapon. Um, I think of it as a weapon that is being used in a homicide. It is a weapon. And here is why it is odorless. It mm -hmm. is tasteless. Mm -hmm. And if ingested in large enough quantities, meaning enough of those little bottles, even sure. though these bottles of, of eye drops are tiny, you pour a couple of those or more into a glass of water or yes. anything, uh, pudding, and it can start to slow down the heart Right. The lungs, the brain. Mm -hmm. Think of like a sedative. Sure. If you do it over a prolonged period of time in smaller doses, you, you're ill sure. and they can't figure out what's causing your yep. illness. So uh, we and, have and seen a rash of them. When you use any type of poison or toxin with somebody who is older or who has pre-existing conditions, it is harder to detect because irregularities with the body are expected for uh, an older person with pre-existing condition. So yeah, um, unfortunately clever, but fortunately not clever enough. 
Yes, not clever enough. And what we'll see is this incredible exchange Mm -hmm. between the defendant who went on Mm -hmm. and on for hours, as is her right. Now, at this point, she'd already been convicted, but she's going on and on about how the state is wrong and you're all Mm -hmm. wrong and I'm right. And, you know, at this point, when you've been convicted, you're trying to get mercy. And Mm -hmm. that's why Anna, doesn't this case remind you of a case that I was previously presented with regarding the cheesecake, the woman who gave her the poison cheesecake. And even when uh, she gave to her neighbor to steal her identity, uh, the identity theft. Right. And and one of the most interesting points of that case was not just the facts of the case, but it was also the reaction of the defendant during the trial, this kind of indignation. Um, and real failure to accept any accountability. So for me, that as the criminologist, that's the interesting piece. When are people accountable for their behavior and when aren't they? So, yeah. And in this case, she just doubled down doubled on down. all of her denials and blamed it on everyone else, mm-hmm. everyone else, which, you know, look, I think she was going to receive a very long sentence, but she didn't do herself any favors. And then the judge the judge was in, you know, intolerant of this. And then let's just say they both were a little pissy with each other <laughs> and we, we will play some of that. So let's get to our first case out of Milwaukee. And, you know, we have been following this particular case for several years now from the moment of the arrest, because it's just been such an interesting case. So the victim here is 62 year old Lynn Hernan, who, um, was apparently given a laced water mm-hmm. bottle. So the mm-hmm. water bottle would have had the uh, eye drops in them. Her convicted, the convicted killer here, who's just been sentenced to um, life, yeah. is 40-year-old Jesse Kurchevsky. And this is a woman with a history, if you might recall, of defrauding people, forging documents. Mm-hmm. And so police say the motive here was really clear. Mm-hmm. It was all about Lynn's money. Sure. And... Yeah especially when you start seeing how she's transferring money to her own account from Lynn and using Lynn's credit cards, you start to really see a picture of, you know, and she then became the beneficiary, which was very Uh interesting when family members were like, wait a minute, who's this woman? Even though she's a family friend, why is she the beneficiary? So it it, it really started to get very fishy, very, Mm -hmm. very fishy. So um, a little bit of background here on our victim. Lynn was a retired beautician who loved animals, and she was very close with her family. Uh, Lynn and Jesse were family friends, and Jesse stepped in as Lynn's primary caretaker as her health was declining. And apparently Lynn's mother had been caretaker before, and then Lynn took over. So, you know, there's one story that's told, and we see this a lot. So apparently this was first viewed as either an accident or a suicide. Because when police responded to the home, uh, this would have been at 455 on October 3rd of 2018. Again, how long we've been covering this. Mm -hmm. Police find Lynn in her recliner. She's unconscious, but, you know, and, you know, just she's not well. Mm-hmm. Crushed, med- crushed medication is found on her body along with a plate containing other crushed medication. Mm-hmm. And firefighters pronounced her at the scene dead because they said she hadn't been breathing. And um, it was Jesse who called 911. But before she called 911, she called her mother. Four minutes, a four minute conversation while we have someone here who's not breathing. Right. Where's the focus here, Tracy? Where is the focus on the emergency? You know, um, I have been involved in a couple of cases like this. Remember, before I was a, a, a criminologist, I was a social worker for the first eight years, and I did some work with elder abuse. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, cases like this, I had seen. Now, I, I never worked a case that resulted in death. They were uh, fortunately the victim was still alive. But one of the things I remember being very conscious of is that the caretaker feels this um, very dichotomous, very kind of dual role. First of all, they feel as though the fa- oh, I, I've seen this, that, that the family isn't actually as present 
um, as they should be. And they're, therefore, they are laden with all of the burden of, of the caretaking, which is odd because you were hired as the caretaker. Of course, you are responsible for this. But the thing that complicates it in the cases that I personally witnessed was um, the fact that the skill set of the caretaker is often um, not adequate for the responsibilities that they're going to take on. And therefore, I'm, this is not justification for murder. This is not mm -hmm. justification for abuse. So, and I don't know if this applies in this instance, but um, the idea then that the person feels very burdened and overwhelmed and somehow entitled for the behavior that they exhibit with the individual that they are charged to care for. So it doesn't seem out of character for somebody who is engaging actively in abusive behavior, providing somebody with toxic substances in this case, um, who intends to perhaps, we don't know, perhaps the intention was just to reduce their lucidity so that they could then obtain more financial control over the individual. And then it goes bad. And so instead of calling the police in, or instead of calling 911 in this instance, they're calling a family member to receive some sort of support to debrief because perhaps she didn't intend to kill her. She just intended to um, incapacitate her to the point where she could take more advantage. I don't know. I'm, of course, these are cases that are rare. Luckily, we don't have a lot of individuals who are uh, murdered through substances by a caretaker. So we don't have a lot of research studies. For instance, in the next one, I'm going to have more research for you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In this one, I, you know, th these are individual cases that come up. So I'm speculating, but perhaps she felt overwhelmed by the experience that she was having. She was in a situation, perhaps she was over her head. She, the, uh, she engaged in abusive behavior by giving the, in, uh, the individual, in this case, Lynn, substances. And then she panicked when um, Lynn was non-responsive. Uh, again, this does not excuse her. This does not justify her actions, but this is perhaps explanation for why she called her mother instead of 911 first. Is it possible, you know, um, because uh, Jesse has a history of forging documents and getting um, all sorts of fraudulent loans to sure. collect money exactly. that, that again, it was all part of a pattern. Yeah. And, and as you say, she may not have intended to kill her. She may have intended to keep her in this ill state of decline until right. she finally did die. Uh, I think, I think that that's, I think that that's possible. But at the end of the day, you're playing Russian roulette here oh, with Russian someone's roulette. life, right? Of course, of course, right. Um, yeah. and, and, and as you say, the facts that we can establish is that Jesse has a history of being a con artist, con, mm -hmm. con artist. She has a history of taking advantage of financial situations to her benefit. Including her own mother. Including, including her, her own ripping right. off her own mother. Exactly. So, so um, yeah. So again, I don't know if she intended to kill her or not. A reasonable person should assume that when you are playing with substances, um, you one of the potential outcomes is death. Mm -hmm. Well, clearly her moral compass was like, hadn't been working in a long time and in pointing in the time. wrong direction. Right, exactly. So Jesse said that Lynn, this is what she tells the police. She tells, you know what? She was becoming very depressed. She was mm -hmm. becoming despondent over the fact that her health was failing. Well, it could have been failing because someone was poisoning her sure. in addition to what else may have been going on in her world. And right. she said that Lynn was refusing right, to take her medication properly and instead was mm -hmm. abusing drugs like Xanax. Right. So um, Jesse also told police that Lynn was sick of the medical community not having answers. Well, if you're not looking for tetrahydrazoline poisoning, Exactly. You might you not, not find it's yeah. not like number one on the list as the doctors going through the checklist of what needs to be right. checked. Right. Um, she also said that she was indeed wanting to take her life. Yet everyone else in her in her life, in Lynn's life, said Lynn didn't want to take her life. Mm -hmm. She was not suicidal. Only mm -hmm. one person said this. The person who called 911, the person who was there. 
the mm-hmm. person who first called her mother for four minutes before 911. Right. So um, after Lynn's death, a few other weird things happened, which made the investigation go in a slightly different direction from the, oh, she probably just, you know, died on her own accidentally. No. Um, here's what's really weird. Jesse and her mom continue to use things that belong to Lynn. They started selling off her property. Like, who are they to be selling her property, driving around in the Jeep that belonged to mm-hmm. Lynn. All of this was intended for Lynn's nephew. So uh, now the family's like, wait a minute, who are these two? Right. So um, then things completely took another turn when mm-hmm. they got to the part of the will and they realized that the beneficiary of the will was supposed to be a relative. And all of a sudden, the beneficiary of the will is Jesse. Sure. Where did she come from? Right. And that really does change the investigation because the entire state was left to Jesse and that just did not seem right to the family and investigators. So then the medical examiner conducted an autopsy and they determined that the woman died of a fatal dose of tetrahydrazoline and that is the main ingredient in eye drops. As we've discussed, it can slow down your entire system Mm -hmm. and it can have the effects of either just feeling really sick for a long time, or it can slow down your system until you die. Literally stop breathing. Sure. That, this is why I, uh, again, this is total speculation. I've never interviewed uh, Jesse, but this is why I suspect that she did not intend to kill her because it's in Jesse's favor to keep her alive and keep her sick. She's using all of her um, assets. She is having her bills paid. She, you right. She, um, she does transfer. Uh, it appears she forges the will, transfers the will to her name, but she's also opening up herself to an investigation when. Lynn dies in that now you you could have an autopsy. I don't know. I just feel like either Jesse is uh, not a great con artist or obviously we know she has no moral compass, but it was in Jesse's best interest to keep Lynn alive and sick because she's getting her financial needs met without alerting the authorities. This is so, but that's interesting. That's very interesting. And that could explain why she was just so adamant in that two hour, you know, speech of hers that it wasn't her, it wasn't her, it was an accident. You know, I do think that one can convince themselves of, I yes, think. Lynn is dead and this is indisputable. But from Jesse's point of view, she can be like, but it was an accident, but it was right. an accident. Right. And she can say it with, with um, a belief You know, sometimes we see people who like really believe a lot of their crap and they're just like insane and they double down on it. Sure. This, but based on your observations, this could be a slightly different interpretation of that. So on July 9th of 2019, officers executed a search warrant at the home that was shared by Jesse and her boyfriend. And that same day she was arrested and yeah. placed on a probation and parole hold because remember she had previous convictions on um, fraud charges and here we go all over again. So for the next 10 days, um, she was interviewed by police on six different occasions and her story changed as things went along. So Jesse claimed that she and Lynn had never really worked out a financial arrangement for the woman's care and that Lynn would give Jesse checks or credit cards to cover car payments for her and her mother as a way of saying, thank you for taking care of me. See, that to me is too loosey goosey. I just don't see that. It's not believable. It's not logical. Yeah. And again, listen, I have at this point in my career, I have seen, you know, as much unsound decision making as I have seen sound decision making. So I can I I can't refute that that is actually possible. I have personally witnessed victims of crime giving um, some individuals in their the, the who ends up being the offender 
this kind of latitude or leeway, which ends up coming back to harm them. Now, this doesn't mean to say that people shouldn't be good hearted and expect the best and that the victim is responsible for the outcome. It's just I cannot conclusively say that that is not plausible. I have seen cases in which this actually has happened. Yep. Well, as investigators continued their questioning, then they asked um, Jesse, well, how do you explain the fact that she had so much tetrahydrosoline in her system? And Lynn said, this is an excellent answer. Well, she was known as using eye drops excessively. Okay. Oh, yeah. you, I mean, you'd have to be pouring bottles sure. in your eyes. Sure. And what yeah. we're talking about is ingesting it. Sure. Right. So as she's being questioned about this, Jesse says that Lynn would buy eye drops in bulk. Hmm. Bulk. I don't who buys eye drops in bulk and containing, you know, buying at least six bottles at a time. And then she was very clear, she said, but she never thought that Lynn would put the bottle of, you know, eye drops in her mouth. Well, of course not. I mean, it's just it. Her story was not making sense. She was trying to come up with an answer for the, but she died sure. of eye drop poisoning. Therefore, right. what is your answer to this? And again, she's just burying herself. And then at another point, at another point, okay, Jesse does not do herself any favors. She tells the cops, well, she used to drink the Visine with vodka. Really? I, you know, I, also, do we, you know, this is one thing I wish I could have seen the actual forensic report. Um, do we know that, you know, how the um, how the substance was entering the body? It's not it's conclusive. Do you have this information? Is it conclusive well, that it's not coming through administrating the drop to the eye? It's definitely coming through oral um, absorption. There was testimony that this had been ingested, ingested. That to get okay. this this amount Okay. It would be ingested. And there was testimony actually on both sides, because remember, remember, Jesse is claiming, oh, yeah, she stirred it up with her vodka. Yeah. So this is that raises one more. So l let's just imagine. Let's just imagine for one minute that the victim here, Lynn, is um, ingesting the substance, I, I I don't know why I can't say it. Tetra tetrahydrosoline, tetrahydrosoline mm -hmm. um, with vodka. Let's just imagine that this is what's happening. We've all seen that show of like my strange addiction. People do people do strange things. They ingest substances. OK, well, Jesse, you're her caretaker. Why aren't you speaking to the doctor about this? Why aren't you intervening? Why aren't you telling the family member that she has a substance issue, which is dangerous, right? So at the very worst, this is an intentional homicide. At the very least, this is neglect mm -hmm. that led to hum that led to death. So I do think she's culpable regardless. Um, if she assumed the role of caretaker and she watched someone engaging in highly dangerous behavior without intervention, at the very least, you are responsible for manslaughter, like egregious neglect. So there is that part of it, right? The fact that Jesse's saying Lynn wanted to end her life and that she was using it by ingesting mm -hmm. the eye drops and mixing her vodka with it. And then there's the other part of the investigation, which is the financial fraud part of the investigation sure. and looking at Jesse's history. So detectives at the time, um, uncover some debts that Jesse right. and her boyfriend have from a local bingo casino. Mm -hmm. And according to the casino, Jesse and her boyfriend mm -hmm. owed $40,000. They had lost $40,000 right. gambling. That is mm -hmm. a lot of money. So they were banned from the casino. And of course they had some serious debts. Jesse's mother, Jennifer also told authorities that she has been a victim of her own daughter's fraudulent schemes. She said that Jesse allegedly stole personal checks of her mother's along with her mother's identification and the title to her car. And that this information was all used to obtain loans without the mother's consent. So there is a clear pattern here of, of Jesse taking advantage of everyone in her life. Right. Right. 
Right. Again, I'm trying to offer like a range of explanations because this is, how, you know, a crime like this that is so particular. And again, I don't have any research to be able to say, well, in 90 percent of crimes where caretakers poisoned to death there. Um, I, so I have to rely on what could be plausible. So either way, you're talking about an individual with a history of taking advantage of people who's in a, who accepts a position of caretaking, who at the very least is negligent in intervening in dangerous behavior at the very worst uh, is um, actually doing the poisoning. And somewhere in the middle is maybe somehow encouraging the behavior and passively standing by. Either way, we have culpability and we also have an individual who has who has a financial gain at the end of the day, giving you motive. A lot, a lot yep. of financial gain because police say that she wrote checks in Lynn's name to Jesse, right? right? Forging them into her own bank account. So that was an easy one to trace. So between the transfer of money from mm -hmm. um, Lynn's account to Jesse's, plus there's the credit cards that she used, sure. it's at least $300,000. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Right. So it's, significant amount of money. So there's your motive. So Jesse's trial began October 24th of 2023, and the state's case was pretty clear. Jesse had taken advantage of an elderly friend mm -hmm. for her own financial gain. Right. So her defense was that Lynn was suicidal. She had taken her life, that it was either suicide or accident on Lynn's behalf of her own doing. So on November 14th of 2023, jurors convicted Jesse of first-degree intentional homicide, mm -hmm. theft of movable property over $100,000, right. and theft of movable property between $10,000 and $100,000. Right. Very specific charges to the area here. It's Michigan law. So then on sentencing day, which was recent, April 5th, mm -hmm. Jesse had a lot to say in her own defense. She mm -hmm. took two hours it's excruciating to listen to these two hours, but you know what? It's it's the defendant's life. Mm -hmm. And if you've had a trial and everyone has been speaking mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and saying things about you, and this is your chance to say what you have to say, mm -hmm. I suppose you should take all the time that you want. But it was excruciating. She had written it down and she was reading from a yellow pad, her hands, you know, handcuffed. So she's like changing right. pages, moving pages. She was pretty stoic through most of it and then was emotional at one part. And we're going to play that. But really, she blamed everyone and she stuck to her story. So mm -hmm. here is Jesse, in her own words, talking to the court. It is a lot to be accused and convicted of murder when I didn't do it. It won't bring her back and it won't make her loss any easier. You're holding me responsible for what she did. Those were her decisions, her choices, her actions, and no one else's. To me, Tracy, that one part where Jesse says, but this, meaning convicting her and sending her to prison, isn't going to bring her back. Oh, my gosh. It's like this is what we talk about when we talk about yeah. justice. Right. And, and this is where, again, the case is, an, is somewhat of an anomaly um, in the fact that we actually have a death. Many people engage in fraud, fraudulent behavior to take other people's money. Luckily, most of it doesn't end in death. But here's the piece that is most fascinating for me as a criminologist is, you know, this kind of reasoning is somewhat typical for perpetrators, but I also find it even typical um, among students that I teach. And not that they, I, I get a lot of questions about what is the purpose of punishment, right? And so we have to understand the purpose of punishment can have a lot, uh, it could be twofold, could be threefold. Of course, it is first and foremost meant to, that for the state in our country in a democracy, to address the wrongdoing that occurred to one of their citizens, to one of our citizens. It's also to hold people accountable for behavior, to both deter them from future bad actions, but to deter the general public from engaging in similar bad actions. It's called general deterrence. And, you know, finally, some bit of punishment is also to bring justice to the victim. Now, 
your show focuses on that third point a lot. We want justice for the victim. But I really hope your viewing audience understands that that is a cursory or secondary consideration. The American criminal justice system was not built on um, a system that tries to bring justice to the victim. Victims and that's are- kind of my th- and that's exactly my thing. I feel that our justice system needs some fine tuning of course. to to have a little bit more consideration for the victim and justice while still obviously, you know, the tenets of our justice system about innocent until proven guilty. I get that. Right? But even punishment in our system is really we're the United States, we're a democracy. Punishment, therefore, is focused on um, the offender, right? And the, that's why sometimes people don't like it. But the offender has way more rights in a trial than the victim because oh, at the absolutely. end of the day, at the, even though I, as somebody who works primarily with victims and does re- research based on victims, I understand why this criminal justice system focuses on the offender's rights more because they're going to lose liberty or they're going to lose life in rare instances. And in those instances, that's where we have a constitutional issue. If you're gonna deprive somebody of liberty in a democracy, you better be sure that the facts of the case are in order. But so that's why here, in some ways, I think that this Jesse is, uh, I don't wanna use a pejorative term, but she's ignorant, right? To the fact, um, hello, Jesse, we are not here to bring back, to bring Lynn back to life. We're here to hold you accountable for an egregious act, both because you are uh, punishment is fitting in this instance for you as an individual and also to send a social message that this behavior is not tolerated. And then thirdly, sure, again, I'm sorry that it's third. I know you don't like it, Anna. I don't like it. But yeah. And then in some way to bring about some level of justice for the victim here. Mm hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, then after her two hours, it was the judge's turn. Right. And, you know, sometimes judges will have a comment. And I always find the judge's comments always for me among the most fascinating of the process, Mm -hmm. because you're waiting to hear what they're going to say about what just transpired. And Mm -hmm. there they will issue the sentence. Now, they don't necessarily have to explain themselves. Sometimes yes. they do. This judge really wanted to have a conversation with the public. Yeah. And wanted everyone to understand what she had seen and witnessed and why right. she was going to sentence as she did. So um, <laughs> the judge really did have a lot to say. I want you to listen here because at one point, uh, Jesse does interrupt the judge and the judge does not like that. And she snaps back. Understandably. I saw everything. I have to ask out loud. It's in a rhetorical question, but were you poisoning Lynn Hernan all along following your release from prison? No, I'm not asking for an answer. This is my time. So do not interrupt me. She got markedly sicker following your reinsertion in her life on a daily basis, ultimately ending up in the hospital in September of 2018. Unexplained, couldn't figure out what was going on. But what do we know? She got better. What could not have been happening in the hospital? Someone poisoning her with THZ. I have to say, I mean, that moment that the judge is like, do not interrupt me. Right. Do not interrupt me. This is my time. You know what? Sometimes, how can I put this? It's just like this woman who just went on for two hours really did need to be put in her place. You need to just shut up now and listen to why you're here and why you're going to spend the rest of your life in prison. Yeah, I mean, this is a clear display of two things you have, right? You have a judge who is uh, responsible for the court and delivering the opinion of the court. But we have accepted in our criminal justice system that the judge, especially in particularly heinous cases, can also deliver like a moral argument to the to the perpetrator. 
um, and which the judge did. But also the judge is human. Can you imagine sitting for two hours, listening respectfully to somebody go on and on, failing to be <laughs> accountable for anything? Never, I mean, never mind if, if you don't, the, the death was accidental. How about all the money that you took? How about all uh, your failure to intervene uh, in, in this situation? And then, so the judge responds both, I think, as a judge and as a human being. Would you shut up? I'm tired of this now. <laughs> and also, I have, I'm the judge. I have a role to play, not just in your sentencing, but to deliver the opinion of the court, which includes my opinion on your morality. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So Jesse was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 40 years. So she's going to be in her 80s. Uh, at best when she is eligible for parole. Mm -hmm. um, the judge also called yeah. her diabolical. Yeah. Which is, of course, one of my favorite words and descriptors for much of what we talk about here. Yeah. But yeah, diabolical. You know, you slowly kill someone. Yeah. 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 It really is. So in addition to the jail time, Jesse was ordered to pay $380,000 in restitution and an additional $16,000 for the expenses of the state witnesses at the trial. Mm -hmm. um, the likelihood the that she's paying that is uh, less than 1%. It's just um, not happening. So, yeah. But these are often um, kind of ceremonial or um, good faith um, efforts by the court to send a message to the perpetrator and the community that you're going to be responsible in more than one way. You're going to lose your liberty. And you do have, at least in theory, because in practice it's unrealistic, but at least in theory, you do need to pay restitution to the court and to this family. Mm -hmm. And uh, the judge reminded her that she could not financially gain from the telling of her story. I would think right. that that is already a law in Michigan. So, yes, but I is. guess just a reminder, one of these like, Missy, if you think you're going to make any money by telling your story, right? let me remind you, you will not. So, oh, uh, just, you know, at the, when these cases end, when there's, and we talk about this and, you know, families use words like some families can say that there's closure. Other families say, you know, it's just, I'm, is it really closure? We've still lo lost our loved one. This one's going to prison, but she hasn't even apologized. Not that an apology is going to make anything better, but it just, it's just sad. It's it just sad. sad. There's no bringing Lynn back. No, there's no bringing Lynn back. And, and I hate to um, I think we're wrapping up on this case, but I hate to also bring up one other point. You know, this is a case, right? So we're looking at the individual level analysis of what went on um, it, between Jesse and Lynn. But I, the, like the the kind of the the process, the the person in me that processes information on the aggregate at the macro level, I'm concerned that not just from this case. I've been talking about this for about five or six years. That we're going to see increase. Um, increase in cases like this. But I do hope that you and your audience starts to think about what is this going to mean for care for our, our aging society? Do we have adequate people? Do we have adequate provisions? Um, I I'm worried that these kind of cases are going to increase. I think you're right to worry. Our next case caught my attention because once again, you have a repeat offender mm -hmm. who is clearly a threat to women, all women. Mm -hmm. How is it possible that this man was not flagged as high risk before he was released from prison? Nine days later, just in one night, he was captured on street cameras stalking several women. Mm -hmm. Several women. They ran away. But the last victim, number six, say police, did not get away. And he killed her. Right. Right. Now, even though this murder occurred in England, I wanted to cover it. Sometimes we do cover international sure. crimes for a lot of reasons. This one I found fascinating because it really shows how we are not the only country and the only justice system right. mm -hmm. that is grappling with, is challenged with what to do with repeat offenders. Right. I believe that there are some people who cannot be rehabilitated and cannot be put 
outside with people that must be locked up for the rest of their lives. But the laws don't always align with keeping someone in prison for the rest of their lives. Oh, God, until they do something that they finally are Mm -hmm. put away for life. But here's the problem. In order to reach that level, a life has to be taken. Sure, sure. And, you know, again, one of the things we, we, we study in criminology is to what extent are people unable to be rehabilitated? It is a small percentage. Fortunately, it's a small percentage, but they do exist. The problem, I don't know if you want me to get into this now or you want to talk a little bit about the case. The, the, the piece that I honed in on was this classification of medium risk versus high risk. Yes. Do you want to give some more? So case? here, yeah. yeah. Uh, and Tracy's really hit, hit it on uh, the nail on the head here because how he was classified as either as medium as opposed to a high risk really had implications for how he would be supervised and how he would be released. But I'm going to make an argument that even as a high risk offender, he was still going to step out and do exactly what he wanted to do. And we're going to get into that. But I think you're right that that does that there are so many flaws here. And the reason we're still discussing this case, even though it happened a few years ago, is because the family has pressed the Mm -hmm. government and the justice system to be held accountable and investigations are still going on to figure out where the system failed. Well, you know what? Let me tell you something. Save a few bucks here. Let me tell you where you failed. You should have never released the guy. And you don't need to be, you know, a PhD or a research scientist to know that that is where the system first failed. Mm -hmm. And, And I'm sorry, you know, but that's the first level. So, Let's let's talk a little bit about the case. And then, Tracy, you can explain to us the difference in how he was classified. So the victim here is 35 year old Zara Alina. She had recently graduated from law school. She was working on becoming a lawyer. Mm -hmm. She had recently been admitted to the solicitor's role, which is kind of our equivalent to the bar, you know? You get accepted and then you're ready to go. And that Mm -hmm. is where she was in her life. The convicted killer here is Jordan McSweeney, had a lengthy criminal background by the time of Zara's murder. He had 28 convictions for 69 crimes dating back to 2006. Burglary, vehicle theft, assault on police, battery, assaulting, causing bodily harm. And he had been released from custody nine days before the murder. Mm -hmm. Despite his criminal history, he was classified as a medium risk offender. Okay, Tracy, what what would have been the big difference here between medium and high risk as far as how he would have been supervised? Well, before I do that, I think I need to explain maybe to your audience what how we even determine risk. Mm -hmm. Okay, because I think a lot of people in the general public think that risk assessment or risk evaluation, as we call it, is an exact science. It is not. I've actually written on this. So something I'm, I'm excited to talk about. So just let's keep in mind that risk assessment and and most of my research comes in risk assessment for domestic violence, not in general violence. That's usually I'm a criminologist. That's more the realm of psychologists. But I've done I've I've worked with psychologists on understanding this process. So risk assessment is a decision making process in which you determine or estimate or identify or quantify risk. Okay, you can imagine right then and there that's going to be difficult, right? Anyone who's had a child or who's had caretaking responsibilities, your kid falls down, scrapes their knee. Oh, that's a risk you didn't identify. Some risk we're willing to accept as a, as a general public, right? The kid mm-hmm. scrapes the knee as part of growing up. Other risks we're not willing to accept, like an individual with 69 prior crimes um, getting out and committing murder nine days later. However, you have to understand what's going on with this process. So we generally distinguish, um, there's two types of risk assessments. One is a clinical assessment, and this is in the US, but England has a very similar system. Um, And then there are actuarial assessments. Mm 
The clinical assessment in individuals meeting with usually a forensic psychologist, definitely a clinical psychologist, they're being put through um, a series of questions and exams to determine their potential risk for violence to self or others. Mm -hmm. Now, that's going to happen over the period of um, weeks, but more so months. You're meeting with the same individual going through these clinical assessments, okay? Actuarial assessments are where you're using instruments to determine likelihood of risk. I've done a lot of this work, for instance, with the lethality assessment uh, protocol. It's an assessment to determine victims of domestic violence risk of being murdered. So mm. where are they at risk for some sort of low level violence, still terrible, versus where are they at risk for lethality? Um, the Actuarial evaluations take into consideration data that we have from analyzing previous homicides or, um, or previous high levels use of violence of a predatory rape, for example. And we take a look at what factors were present in those cases, and then we create an actuarial list. Oh, for instance, with homicide, you know, is there a gun present in the home? Does the individual have a past history of using violence? Um, has the individual threatened violence to this particular victim or another victim? Once you get enough check marks on this actuarial list, we then deem you as a risk, low, medium, or high. So now that so I think you can kind of see these are not exact sciences. The, no, they're not. You're in right. the clinical assessment, it's does the one person you're interacting with deem you to be a threat? One of the things I came to learn working with psychologists who evaluate violence in general, not just domestic violence, was, listen, we're in settings in which everyone's violent. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you're asking us to determine some level of violence. So perhaps this, I'm not saying this happened in the case, but mm -hmm. here's a for instance. Perhaps in this case, this individual's being deemed medium because there's also people being deemed high who have done even more heinous, more egregious things. I'm not saying that happened, Correct. but it's a possibility. Second of all, if the individual was deemed medium risk versus high risk because they received an actuarial assessment, they might have had four, but not eight indicators of potential violence. So this is not in any way an exact science. No, and I don't think anyone, you know, we're dealing with human beings and human right. behavior. And this right. is, you cannot always measure and predict these things. Um, my argument here, Tracy, is I think it wouldn't have truly mattered that much between medium and high risk based on what I read, because the difference, as I understand it, there mm -hmm. would have been, had he been deemed high risk, he then would have had to stay in what's called a probation hostel. So some some sure. kind of, you know, housing that was a little bit more restrictive. And then he'd have to adhere to a curfew and wear, a, you know, an ankle monitor or a GPS monitor. Here's where I think that still wouldn't have been enough in this case, because what this guy did, according to the London police was, he never even went to his first probation meeting. Yeah. He like, right. he took off. He right. was done. He was out and he wasn't going to follow the rule. And because of bureaucracy and because it takes time by the time he doesn't show up and then they're trying to locate him and then they issue something that's the equivalent to an arrest warrant, it's too late too because late. Yeah. Zara is dead. Sure. So my argument on this one is, Maybe they would have noticed that he wasn't at the, you know, offenders hostel or whatever their hotel sure. is and that he didn't check in. And so maybe they would have been on the lookout for him a little sooner. But then they claimed they still couldn't find him. Do, do you know what I'm saying? No, no, I no, don't I know this would have prevented it. I hear what you're saying. This individual seems to have predatory violent tendencies. Yeah. Yeah. The, the and, and your argument is whether he was released under medium supervision as a, as a medium risk offender or under high risk supervision, the fact remains that this individual um, probably was already hell bent on engaging in some violent act. Um, yeah. Listen, that what you're saying is completely plausible. Um, and in this case, unfortunately, it happened. 
Um, so, you know, for again, for me, looking at it from the system perspective, it's we want to reduce the, the potential risk. Risk assessments are not an exact science yet, but we also, and I'm going to earn no points with your audience here. You know, we're at there. We're in a very interesting place. Keep in mind, the modern criminal justice system is about 100 years old. Mm-hmm. We've been studying human behavior for thousands of years. So we're, it's a very inexact science at this point. But here's what I'm going to say. We have to decide in a democratic society. Do you want to anyone? Do you want to hold in prison in an car, you know, in, car, in a facility, anyone who shows any potential risk, therefore resulting in over incarceration of individuals who actually would not have engaged in violent behavior? Or do you want to let a few people out who engage in violent behavior to uh, reduce the likelihood that you're holding unnecessarily people who are truly rehabilitated? Unfortunately, I think those are two that's where we are, Anna. You don't like it. I don't like no, it. No, no, they're very hard but, choices. I absolutely but these are agree hard with you. Choices. I, Either, I agree with you. And that's a, why it's not a win win. It's a no. lose lose at this point. That's why I so wanted to have this conversation about this case because it really forces us to, to us to think and make decisions about what we think is justice and is fair right. here, you know, because sometimes there are people that no matter how many times you tell them no, the only thing that works with them is literally behind bars. Now, is it possible? Is it possible that as if he had been labeled high risk and that he hadn't made it home and blew his curfew from the residential facility, right. that maybe there right. was more supervision, that maybe they would have acted more quickly? I think that that is possible. I think that that is possible. But his blowing off his probation hearing also tipped off the police that it was time to get started and and start looking for the man. And then there's another layer to this. Sure. Yep. So first you have the immediate question, as I said at the beginning of the podcast. One, should this guy ever have been let out? OK, so you have that whole series of uh, factors that you must yep. evaluate. And then there is the fact that London, certainly in this part of town, has security cameras on the street and that they are monitored by people, Mm -hmm. right, by different council districts to keep the streets safe. Mm -hmm. And here we have a man between midnight and two, and we're going to show you this video where he's going after women. Right. And yet nowhere in this time period, because Zara wasn't killed till after two. Yeah. Did anyone connect the dots and say, how do you look at a man who looks like he's drunk and he's swaying and he's chasing women? Do you think he's just a drunkard who can't do any harm? Or do you not know he's a recent parolee with a violent past whose intoxication is not going to stop him from committing a crime? I mean, the, the things that this man did... There was a he was standing outside a restaurant watching a woman and masturbating on the street. This this yeah. this went on for hours and he wasn't stopped. Sure. So this raises the question for all of us as a society, you know, the penal system, the justice system, the security system, sure. the police system. Failure across sure. the board. Right. Failure, failure, failure. Okay, let's get in. Let's get into the details, and then Tracy, I'm going to ask you more about you know the the the, the different parts of this. Um, man, this is just unbelievable. So, he was released in June of seventeen, June seventeen of twenty twenty two. Okay, mm-hmm. and as we said, he blew off his parole meeting, and then by the twenty fourth. There was the equivalent to a warrant issued for his arrest. And then within the next 36 hours, the man goes on a reign of terror. And this is when women are being stalked. And finally, one is murdered. So much of this is captured on camera. And we're going to show you all the surveillance video because this is why it's so chilling. You're watching these women running for their lives. Right. Yep. You're seeing the precursor to (sighs) the ultimate uh, act of violence. Yeah. And I'm I'm just going to say this. There isn't a woman out there who's listening to this, and I'm sure a lot of men as well, 
who know exactly what that fear is when you find yourself in a dark space late at night, yeah. you're, you know, especially when you're younger and all of a sudden you're scared and, and you're being followed and you're running, right. you know, everyone has experienced this. Okay. This chilling footage is just unbelievable. So it takes place between June 25th and June 26th of 2022. Mm -hmm. And you see this man prowling and looking for a victim. Now, right after midnight, he'd been kicked out of a bar for harassing women, sexually harassing them and groping sure. them. Sure. Okay, Tracy. So sure. here you have a man who's kicked out for this inappropriate behavior. Right. The question is, is that something that should have had a phone call to the cops? I don't know. Certainly would I mean, have helped. It's it, right. Hindsight is twenty twenty. Isn't that what they say? I mean, yeah. these are difficult things. The average person is probably looking at him as an annoyance and mm -hmm. not a threat. Right. Yes. So, that's key. Yeah. Yeah. And so this again, when we look at cases, you know, in the rear view mirror, it's easy to see all of the places that we would have intervened. But the average person is not making these assessments. Um, and all, and obviously, the average person does not know who this individual is. They have no idea that Jordan is a convicted felon who has at least a medium risk assessment mm -hmm. applied to him. Yep. Yeah, that's just it. You really, you just really, really stripped it apart there. Did people see him as an annoyance or a threat? Was he just another drunk guy who was inappropriate or was he a killer? Right. Oh right. my gosh. Okay. So he's been kicked out of the bar and you can see him on all these videos where he's swaying. Mm -hmm. You know, he is not steady on his feet. We don't know whether he's intoxicated, or whatever, but he is not steady on his feet. Now, I want you to watch this video. Those of you who are watching, those of you who are listening, I'm going to describe it to you. So he's following this woman. Her face is blurred out and he's after her and she's accelerating her pace and she tries to get away from him from and she darts into a grocery store. You can see all the fruit and the produce on the sidewalk. And, you know, she just walks between the, the produce and goes inside. Then he follows her inside. Then he comes out and he waits outside. She pauses, waits to see, like, is it safe for me to go? She runs out and he follows her. Thank God she's faster than him and she manages to get home safely. She loses him somewhere. Okay, now let's get to the next victim. There's a woman walking on one side of the street. He's on, on his side and she is accelerating her pace because she's worried about She's getting a bad vibe from this guy who's right. following. And mm -hmm. there are even other witnesses on the street who are watching this and are kind of like crossing the street to the other side, thinking maybe this woman might be in trouble. She manages to accelerate her pace fast enough where she manages to get home. And don't forget this incident where the man is standing outside of a chicken restaurant, masturbating, right. watching a woman eat. That alone should have been a call to the police. This is a product of the world we live in, in which people behave badly, especially late at night related to drinking. And we just think that this is obnoxious behavior. And so this is as much, I think, um, an example of missed opportunity by our criminal justice system using closed caption cameras, using you know investigative tools, as it is a, a statement about us. Like, OK, he was just outside the chicken restaurant masturbating. Not a big deal. Doesn't raise the it's not enough of a red flag to call the police. Like, what does that say about the society in which we live in? That this doesn't reach the level of a police intervention, a phone call from a citizen. I remember I was in high school and I was at the library. I was at the library, the public yeah. library, not the school library. And there was a man across the way from me with a raincoat. I swear to you. And he flashed me. I panicked. I grabbed my books. I didn't even say anything to the librarian. I ran as fast as I could out right. of there. I was so scared. And I know I should have screamed, but instead I was really scared. And there was a police officer outside and I ran to the police officer and I said to him what the man had done. And the cop just kind of like, I was what, maybe 15, 16 years old. And he's looking at me, finds a story kind of funny. And I'm like, I think you should go to the library. I you know, I'm panicked and running for my life. I just want to get home. And the cop is just like, 
kind of finding it like comical because he's just masturbating lady, yeah. you know? Like, you know, Anna, it's so interesting. I was just talking to a student who's looking to do a, a thesis and a research project. I, I was asking students in my class about how common sexual harassment is for their generation because some research is emerging saying that the cat calling from the 70s, 80s and 90s is reducing. You know, you walk by a, a construction site, you walk by a group of men, you walk by a bar and the cat calling that we all endured. And it's, it, it looks like it is reducing. And when I told some of my students the very similar story to you of um, having at least two or three times between the time I was 10, 11 and 16 years old, having a man flash himself or masturbate, um, most of my students were like, where were you living? And I'm like, no, this was a pretty typical 70s, 80s, 90s kind of experience. I'd like to know from your viewers who are younger than 30, if this is something that ever happened. I don't know if we can ask them to put in the comments as the researcher in me is wondering, like, is this reducing among this population that this um, very bizarre stranger street level um, sexual harassment, including exposure and masturbation, is this still occurring? Oh, I think so. I think yeah. so. I mean, well, I mean, this case says it, but is it an anomaly? I don't know. Um, I so um, yeah, maybe that's I know a public library, done. a public, yeah. and maybe public everyone's library. like, well, of course it happened in a public library because everyone's allowed in there. You know what? I and I was downstairs because the children's section was upstairs. I remember that because again, I'm a young adult <laughs> doing my homework. I just it was both the experience and then the police reaction. Sure. Right? The police reaction. And, I, you know, perhaps if I'd been older and more mature, I would have gone to the librarian and I should have screamed. So what I should have done, I should have screamed, yeah. gone to the librarian. But instead, I panicked and ran for my life, you know. And, and let me reverse, because the criminologist kicked in as opposed to the former victim advocate social worker. First of all, I'm really sorry that that happened to you, Anna. And nobody should ever have to experience that. And you deserved a better response from the criminal justice system. And don't, please don't hold yourself responsible for not screaming, um, for just getting yourself out of there and into a safe space. I just, you know, sometimes you yeah. just don't, you know, not but right. fleeing, it's fleeing a dangerous situation is always very good. Yeah. Like getting yourself out of a dangerous situation is paramount. Anyway, we've taken the left turn here Sorry. because yeah. of, of, th of this man, but let's, let's get back to Jordan McSweeney here. So, we're we're following him, you know, uh, CCTV has captured him harassing these two women very clearly chasing them and they got away. Police say that ultimately, you know, he made five attempts in this window where he was stalking women, which raises the question I raised a little bit earlier is like, OK, if the whole point of having these security systems is for peep is for safety for people to monitor them and try and save someone. The argument has been made that apparently, you know, people were out sick. They were not as staffed as they usually are. And that apparently one of the people who was monitoring the cameras actually was dealing with another situation involving another crime victim. Sure. So not a perfect system. Yeah. Uh, one thing I want to point out about security systems is there are some security systems that are built to be preventative, for instance, like a home security system. There's other security systems that are reactive, that are meant to provide investigators or the courts or police with information to build a case. I don't know if we're at the point where um, CCTV, closed caption television, uh, cameras, these I'm not CCTV, I'm sorry, there's another word for it. But these the camera systems that are being used on the streets are actually at the place where they're preventative or they're used for evidence collection after a crime has occurred. I wanna say that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is something I think that in particular, you know, individuals under 30 are kind of grappling with like uh, GPS or monitoring. You know how you can have your friend's location or your partner's mm -hmm. location on the phone. I think a lot of individuals assume technology is really useful for preventing crime. I don't think most um, street cameras or 
those put, sharing your location is actually preventing crime. It's it helping, be, you know, to alert people maybe in real time something's not right. Maybe and we'll this because maybe right yeah. when but Zara I think right left the bar. Right. Her friend took a cab. Zara said she would walk. And her friend said to Zara, call me when you get home so I know you get home safely, which I do with all of my friends. Do male and this. Female. Right. I'm not sure it's actually a great preventative measure, measure, but it does make us feel better. Right. Or at least you can start calling and start, you know, like when I didn't hear from my friend and I was like, oh, my God, something's happened. And I start calling her entire family. And then, you know, her brother-in-law is on her way to the apartment to knock on the door. You know, she's like, for God's sakes, I was on a long walk for five hours. I didn't have cell service. Yeah. Okay. But if something had happened, time was of the essence. Sure. Okay. Sure. So anyway, back to Zara. So she leaves the bar. Again, her friend takes a cab. She decides to walk. I really wish that she had taken the cab. I really do. But of course... Zara never called, but that wasn't the only thing, obviously, that tipped everything off. About 2.17 a.m., Jordan starts to hunt Zara. Remember, he's been hunting all night. Right. And then he followed her for a while, and he grabbed her from behind. He wrestled her to the ground, and then he dragged her body into an area where the camera couldn't see him. Right. Now, he does appear to have been intoxicated enough to probably not even have been aware of the cameras. I think he pulled her into a dark space like an alleyway, obviously, right, to assault her, sexually assault her and kill her. Her death was a horrible and long and violent, torturous death. He sexually assaulted her. And then for nine minutes, he beat the living daylights out of her and stomped on her. Nine minutes. If we were to sit here in silence for no, nine minutes. No, painful. No. Horrific. Horrific. In fact, she was pummeled. Pummeled. She was in such horrible condition that when um, passersby found her, to they say they've been so traumatized by it. They can't yeah. even, they can't unsee what they have seen. No. And that's, you know, that happens a lot, I would think, Tracy, with witnesses mm -hmm. who sure. have nothing to do with anything, just happen to be there. And now they are forever traumatized by the fact that they just stumbled upon it. Exactly. Yeah. And of course, this is particularly heinous because um, the condition that her body must have been in. <sighs> oh, my God. So, you know, she was she was clinging on to life. I mean, she was b just barely breathing. Uh, paramedics got there. They tried over an hour to save her and she was transported to the hospital, but she was pronounced dead by the next morning, almost at 10 a.m. the next morning. Mm -hmm. So they tried for hours to revive her. Meanwhile, Jordan has left his DNA behind at the scene, in addition to all the cameras, because remember, the cameras didn't <laughs> capture the actual assault. Yeah, so right. on a railing that he apparently, they found his fingerprints because he, remember, he was unsteady, that right. he held right. on to this railing to steady himself so he could stomp on her. And then, um, of course, all of this video ed evidence of him for the last few hours. Right. Then um, they found more video of him arriving at what looks like an amusement park. He was staying right. in a friend's caravan, which is what we would call like a trailer or mm -hmm. a mobile home. And there's even so there's video of him arriving. Then there's <laughs> video of him the next morning taking his clothes off and putting his clothes into the trash can because it was right. evidence. And then by the next day, they had between the videos and between the fingerprints and obviously the DNA wouldn't have maybe worked as quickly, but his fingerprints would have been in the system. They right. had they had identified him. And then on June 27th, they arrested him and they found his bloodstained sneakers and jeans in the park where he had tossed them out. Uh, get this. I'm sorry. I have no compassion here. Jordan tells officers that he suffers from a split personality disorder. Yeah. There must have been the other one mm -hmm. who misbehaved the night before. Really? Yeah. yeah. Really? Mm -hmm. Wait a minute. And this genius... When the cops say, well, what about all the blood on your sneakers and the clothes that we found in the trash? I was bitten by a dog. That Gen level of blood. Yeah. Yeah. Genius. This man. Yeah. So authorities say after multiple interviews, Jordan showed no remorse. Really? No. I couldn't have predicted that one. No. Of course he's not showing any remorse. 
Oh, my God. They describe it as utter disrespect for the situation. The man doesn't have respect for human life. Give me a break. All of a sudden, you're expecting him to find Jesus? Yeah. Oh, please. I don't even, I don't want to waste my breath on this one. In November of 2022, Jordan pleaded guilty to Zara's murder, mm-hmm. murder and sexual assault, sentenced to life in prison. Right. Okay. Let us hope that finally we are done with this man. But wait a minute. But we're not. But we're not, right? Because the justice system isn't so much about justice for the victims. Okay, this wants me, I want to flip a table at this one. I know, I know. Okay, okay, everyone, stand by. We're going to rock your boat here. Okay, this is incredible. So, Jordan, the man so wronged by the system, insists on appealing his sentence because he feels it's not fair. Oh, life isn't fair to him. F you, buddy. Really? Unbelievable. So he challenges his sentence. And so what does what does the justice system do for this guy? So they shave five years off. They shave right. the five years off about the minimum sentence that he must serve. So now it's down to 33 years. So I guess you could say he won some kind of a victory by shaving five years off and that in 33 years from now, he could really be he released. Could. He could. Mm-hmm. And he'll still be alive yeah. Yeah. and functioning. How right. old is he? He's 30. So he won't even be that old. 63. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I guess you could say it's a victory. And here we go again. Here we go again. This guy's going to come up for parole. And then someone's going to say, oh, he's old. He's sick. He's not a threat. Please. I know. I know this case gets you. Of course, it, it gets me, too. I mean, I, I want to see more information about what the arguments Jordan's attorneys presented on why the 38 years didn't fit the severity of the crime. At face value, this seems heinous and, um, you know, 38 years isn't enough. Again, sometimes, though, what what we get in the news and versus Mm -hmm. what is in the court transcript differ. I'm not justifying uh, I am not justifying his behavior. I don't want to hang out with Jordan. I'm not going to wait for him for those 33 years, you know, but mm-hmm. um, it, it, it at face value, it seems ridiculous that he even had one day shaved off, let alone five years. But again, I need to see the case details. Is there something that we don't have that the court had? And so that is why this case is still in the news in the UK. Sure. Because... They are still trying to figure out what they did wrong, who to hold accountable. And, and, you know, these investigations, these government investigations take forever. So Zara's aunt told Sky News that everyone who failed Zara has blood on their hands. The family is demanding accountability. Here is an interview with Sky News. Even after identifying her, even after touching her dead body, even after burying her, it doesn't compute. We're constantly stuck in a loop of disbelief, constantly stuck in a loop of images in our mind about what happened to her, the horror that she faced, um, the pain she must have endured. We live in a horror film. That is Zara's aunt. Farah Naz. And when she says it's like we live in a horror film that's on a loop, I believe it. Sure. Yeah. And and also the fact, you know, that that there the uh, publicity is focusing on the fact that the beating was nine minutes. I mean, imagine being it, it's a horrible for us to imagine as the general public. But imagine being this girl's family, this woman's family member and just imagining what those nine minutes. So it's important that the general public gets the details to um, fully understand and comprehend how heinous the crime was. But sometimes those details, releasing those uh, details to the general public, also, um, you know, the family's hearing that and thinking about that and reliving that. I mean, and yes, they probably were present in court when that was also released. So, but so that traumatic. is, 
Yeah, that's and you know, one of the things I think that got so much media attention on this case was because the CCTV, and I'm sorry, before I said closed captioning, I meant closed circuit. The CCTV is we really want to believe that we we, we want to believe something is going to protect us from the very worst elements of humanity, whether that's, you know, 200 years ago when it was a strong family system that didn't let you leave the house without a chaperone, or it was 100 years ago with the emerging, you know, police departments in big cities, or now it's with this technology. We really want to believe that something will protect us, me personally, from, you know, the, the the worst elements of our society. And I think we're, you know, we're moving forward and things are protecting us. But at the same time, these horrendous random acts of violence perpetrated by individuals who um, are egregious predators, I don't know how we're protected from them. Well, there were a lot of failures, you know, a, a lot of blame to go around. There were mm -hmm. 19 cameras on that road. And they say at least one employee called in sick that night. And as we said, another staff member was reviewing footage from another incident. And then when it comes to the following up with, you know, parole and then the probation department, the union and group representing them says, look, y'all privatized part of this and that's part of the problem right. and that you have scaled back on people and that this is what happens when you, you know, um, send the work out, if you will. Right. So look, is this, and we talk about privatizing prisons and all this, all this other stuff. At the end of the day, there is a right and there is a wrong and right. you can point in a hundred different directions here. And in Zara's case, it was at every, every time the stopgap or the gates were there, right. they didn't work. No. They dropped. Right. They didn't, nothing in the system worked from the system to when, you know, he was on probation right. to the security cameras on the street. Everything right. failed her that night. Everything failed her. Yeah. 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 Wow. All right. I'll be interested to hear all of your comments on this case. It is time for our comment section. These are the crime cases you all are talking about on social media. Here's our producer, Will Updike. Will, one of the comments last week on YouTube was, why is Will always in this dark dungeon? Oh, I mean, that's a great question. Uh, this is <laughs> this, this is where they keep me. They say it's essential to my productivity. So uh, yeah, I'm just in a hole. They, uh, you know, they lower the lotion down a couple of times a week. Um, <laughs> so I don't get dried out and give me some, give me some water. Um, the, no, this like is the violence of the lamb reference. Will it, it was, I got yeah. It. I got it. <laughs> you two um, are just so dark. Really? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, uh, you know, it's for consistency. We got a, you know, we got a little professional background going on back here. I don't have all <laughs> the trophies or anything to display. I don't have any, like, you, you don't know. have the goat. Where's my Ram? There it is. That's my favorite. The hey, I don't have the scales of justice, you know, the so scales I gotta... of justice. She's a, I mean, that is the one to have is the scales of justice. Oh, absolutely. And absolutely. the but... domestic violence advocate of the year award up there. Okay? Oh, wait, Tracy, congratulations. Y'all yeah, are so decorated. Yeah. Um, decorated. So Good that's, word. that's why I have this. That's, that's the real reason. <laughs> um, anyways, this week, uh, we have a case. I mean, I don't know if it's a hoedown, a hootenanny, or a felony. Uh, after a country singer throws a chair off the roof of a honky tonk, but this case comes out of Nashville, Tennessee, where up and coming. Uh, I don't even know if he's already up and coming or if he's already up. Uh, country star Morgan Wallen was arrested and charged with multiple felonies after an incident at a bar. Um, according to police, this alleged incident occurred at Chief's Bar in the. Evening hours of April 7th, 2024, um, apparently uh, the suspect here, uh, Morgan Wallen, threw a chair off the roof of this establishment uh, onto Broadway Street in downtown Nashville. Pretty, you know, busy area. There's a lot of stuff going on there. But after the chair was launched from the roof, it plummeted about six stories to the street below where the chair landed in the immediate vicinity of two officers. Very, very oh, close here. Oh, that, yeah, wow, okay. Very, very close here. Luckily, um, you know, no one was injured, but witnesses said Wallen was, you know, uh, not exactly remorseful, was kind of laughing after the fact. 
Um, and police said that, you know, the, the, the country singer here created a hazard. This is a direct quote, a hazardous condition by an act that served no legitimate purpose, which I love. Yeah. Generally throwing a chair off a roof serves no legitimate purpose other than maybe some drunken yeah. entertainment. I don't know. Uh, but as I said, nobody got hurt in this. It doesn't appear as though there was any serious property damage, but, uh, Aurora, uh authorities did arrest the country singer on three counts of felony reckless endangerment. In a misdemeanor, disorderly conduct, um, you know, obviously, you know, he's kind of a big deal. He paid his $15,000 bail, was released right away. Um, interesting kind of side note here. His next court date is scheduled for May 3rd, and he's scheduled for a couple of concerts in Nashville, in the city where he'll, he'll have to appear in court for the first and the second. So luckily, the touring schedule lines right up. You can make a court appearance. You can, mm -hmm. you know, some uh, you know, some judges stick. are very flexible that way, you know, because it is you have to make a living. <laughs> well, and it is like, a you know, it's a it's a music city. I mean, mm -hmm. that's uh, like a big part of their their whole identity. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm just wondering with this one with no property damage, didn't actually hurt anybody. What, what do you think, Tracy? I mean, like you're um, in, in terms of justice, like, is this a fine situation? Maybe a PSA, maybe you do a free PSA on not throwing chairs off the roofs of bars. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Well, first I want to say thank you that this particular story did not take place at a fast food restaurant. I thought it, I thought you were going to go through throwing a cheeseburger off Me the restaurant. Me too. Because every time I'm on here, it's crime at the- You couldn't find a good one. Yeah. <laughs> Can you believe like, it? Like he didn't get the sauce that always yeah, triggers a I, violent said, outburst. Yeah, exactly. I thought it was going to be yeah, chicken nuggets being thrown off the roof. <laughs> but, um, so I don't know because this- well, so like listen in we punish the behavior we don't public uh, punish only the outcome mm -hmm. he could have killed somebody she's such a, a professor kid. isn't she such the true. professor men's rea, men's rea, do you do you have a guilty mind did you know you were throwing a chair off of a roof that is six stories high a reasonable person should be able to assume you could harm someone Right. So he's just we call this in, in 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 criminology, the fortunate offender. You engaged in highly dangerous behavior that didn't have a serious outcome. The fortunate offender. I've never yeah. heard that. That's interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, like the drunk driver who doesn't kill someone or right, the person who punches somebody and they fall and hit their head, but doesn't hit the temple. Right. Like you still engaged in behavior that was really risky. So he needs some sort of punishment. Um, yeah, I don't know what it would be, though. And I can't think of anything, you know, clever. I can not think of anything clever or appropriate. So I'll shut up. <laughs> no, that was uh, that was very insightful. What do you think, Anna? What's your what's 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 your punishment for this? Oh, OK. So probably doesn't have, you know, a previous um, my there, guess is there's, there's maybe some other like disorderly what? conduct, but nothing like oh, serious little situation over there that you weren't coming forward with. There you go. <laughs> uh huh. There you go. So perhaps a pattern here. Um, maybe he was intoxicated. Will anyone be served by this man spending a lot of time in jail? I mean, I, I have a feeling it's going to come down to a misdemeanor, right? It, you say it's a felony right now. So he's been charged with, yeah, three felony counts of reckless endangerment and a misdemeanor of disorderly conduct, yeah. which, yeah, maybe he just pleads to the disorderly conduct and they kind of call it a day. And he does community. I think, you know, it's really important. I do believe in community service, right? You have to okay. give back to the community. I don't know what that means. If that means, you know, you're going to fix all the chairs and park benches in the, in the park or or something. He should do something for the community. I think it's really important. Can I add one more thing? Because my daughter just moved to Nashville. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, the no. one who watches you. Yeah, she now goes to uh, Vanderbilt. Little plug there for her. But I went to Broadway two weeks ago. It is packed. Like it is like how it didn't hit someone. If this was a Friday or Saturday night, it, it the, the street is closed off to be a pedestrian. There's only the like like horses and carriages and the the beer peddling carts for the bachelorettes like but how it didn't hit someone he is really fortunate and and i feel like somebody who lives there should have known how packed that street is and how dangerous so i just he has a if he has a prior 
and he's from that area, knows how packed. He should know how dangerous that was. Okay, a little jail time then. All right, Your Honor. <laughs> something, Your Honor. Something. I don't know jail, but like, yeah, he needs a big punishment. I don't know if it right. has to be jail, but it needs to be a. That's that's dangerous behavior. Hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. Um, we got a lot of comments on this one. Mad A said, it's a law where I live. You can't throw stuff off high places. Great. <laughs> Love this already. It's called killer litter. We've had cases of people dying of it, which 100% makes sense. Yep. Um, I just love the way that this whole thing was phrased. Killer litter also sounds terrifying. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, very scary. Yep. Um, Chrissy M said, going to have to write a lot of hits in the clink to pay those fines. Who knows? Who knows? Mm -hmm. Who knows? Um, <laughs> some people like, we were kind of talking about some of the like previous uh, conduct, which I, just full disclosure, I'm, I'm, I, I know like a couple of Morgan Wallen songs. I've heard them before. I'm not like super, I'm not familiar at all with, the, you know, his, his moral conduct or fiber or anything like that. But, uh, Lauren H thought it was pretty immature. They said, I remember my first beer pretty good. <laughs> um, Michelle C with a reference to one of his big hits. Uh, they said last night he let the liquor talk, which is mm -hmm. one of his, his, his big songs. Mm -hmm. Um, it is very biographical. Okay. Mm -hmm. It yeah. is very catchy. Uh, I mean, that one's more about a relationship sort of rekindling oh. over a bottle of wine, but you know, Sue K, uh, with some just great advice to close this one out. They said word to the wise, when you get ready to throw something, make sure you aren't throwing it at a bunch of cops, which yes. Very yes. words to live by words yes. to live by. If you want to, uh, if you want to stay out of trouble, uh, but that is going to do it for this week's comment section. Thank you so much to everybody who sent us. And you can do that over on our YouTube, uh, community page. We're also on Facebook. We're on X. We're on TikTok. Twitter. <laughs> we're on TikTok. uh anywhere anywhere you interact with stuff you can interact with the show um we always love to hear what you think uh and anna you know yes she was anna will definitely respond to your comments i do you know i do like to respond i don't respond to everyone but i do respond a lot i do i do, do. i do I, and we, and we appreciate it, it seems stupid to me for me to ask you what your thoughts are and your opinions are and then not like acknowledge receipt. I mean, yes. Oh, I mean, that's what I'm saying. You're following through on this. You yeah, know? I like the conversation. The conversation of this podcast lives on. Beyond everybody's the saying recording. like and everybody's saying like and subscribe. You're starting a dialogue. It's what there you know. You we're trying to keep the dialogue going over here. Yes, we are. Uh, anyways, I will see you all next week. Bye, Will. I think we're all a little nutty this week because of the eclipse. <laughs> Yes, I think so, yes. too. Yeah, I think yes. so, too. Everything's a little off, but the world didn't end. So that's a good thing. You know, the doomsdayers were wrong once again. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> One day yeah. they will get it right, though. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Tracy, where can people find you, follow you, okay. take your class, <laughs> yes. learn about so, everything? Yeah, I'm a professor at the University of New Haven in Connecticut. Um, sometimes your viewers send me emails to my work address. That's fine. Mm -hmm. um, and you can find my professional page there. Also, I did get Twitter because everybody told me I needed to. I don't know how to use it, but I'm trying. Um, Tracy, I think, dot Tambora. I don't know how it works, but if you, you have Instagram, I'm pretty Inst sure. What am I saying? I it's don't know Instagram. what you're saying. It's not Twitter. Yes, it's Instagram. Thank you. Yes, I'm trying to get there. I'm trying to get hip. Uh, it's it's hard. You are hip. Yeah. Look at you. you. Yeah. Look at you. But with I, your yeah, I love your justice. comments and I love your viewers. And um, yeah, and I they just, love you. I love you, the show. I, I they love, the love show you. And they do a good job. You really do a good job balancing, uh -huh. you know, making sure the victim's perspective is there and letting your guests also share an um, alternative ideas or perspective. So good for you. Having a discussion, you are without a doubt a fan favorite because people love your perspective. We like to get a variety of guests. And that way we can have these great dynamic conversations from different points of view, because yeah. there isn't just one answer or one point of view when it comes to justice here. Nope, so either. you can find this episode wherever you get your podcast, subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also subscribe to our newsletter, which I always say feels so 1990s. <laughs> understand our newsletter thing at truecrimedaily.com <laughs> uh, until next week I'm your host Anna Garcia this is True Crime Daily the podcast and as we always say don't do crime <laughs>